Chapter 7, Section 3. In this section, we'll discuss the methods of finding what we call the definite integral using the fundamental theorem of calculus. This will allow us to compute the integral exactly without using a calculator. At the end of the section, we'll also take a look at improper integrals, which are a variation of the definite integral. Now let's remember back. The fundamental theorem of calculus says if we integrate a function from a to b, and we integrate f prime of x dx, it's going to be the original function at b minus the original function at a. A shorter way of writing this, f of b minus f of a, is to say capital F of x line b to a. What this represents is the antiderivative, and we're saying we're looking over the bounds a to b. So, then our new fundamental theorem of calculus, we'll say the integral from a to b, f prime of x dx, will equal capital F of x from a to b, with this line right here. This is a shorthand notation for what we're going to be doing. Okay, so suppose we want to find the integral from 1 to 4, x cubed dx, using the original form and the shorthand notation of the fundamental theorem of calculus. The first step for both methods is to find the antiderivative of x cubed. So we know that if f prime of x equals x cubed, then the antiderivative will be x to the fourth over 4 plus c. Now that we know the antiderivative, we can incorporate our boundaries to solve for our original integral. Now by the fundamental theorem of calculus, the integral from 1 to 4 x cubed dx is f of 4 minus f of 1, where we now know that our capital F is x to the fourth over 4 plus c. So plugging those bounds in, we have 4 to the fourth over 4 plus c minus 1 to the fourth over 4 plus c. Now, when we cube or quadruple those out, we get 256 over 4 plus c minus 1 fourth minus c. I want you to notice here that the minus sign gets distributed to everything in the second parenthesis, and here the c's are going to cancel out. This is not a coincidence. When we do the definite integral, the c always cancels out when we plug in the bounds, so we don't actually need to write the c when we have actual bounds on our integral. So now we can do 256 over 4 minus 1 over 4, which is 255 over 4, which is approximately 63.75 when you plug that fraction into your calculator. Using the same method but with shorthand notation, we can write the integral from 1 to 4, x cubed dx is, then we write the antiderivative, which is x to the fourth over 4, from 1 to 4. It's the same bounds. We don't need to write the c because again it'll cancel out with our bounds. So that equals 4 to the fourth over 4 minus 1 to the fourth over 4. Again, computing that out, we get 63.75. The shorthand notation is useful because it allows us to see and use the antiderivative in the equation. It also reduces the amount of work that we do by eliminating c from the equation. Because again, c will cancel out of our answer. <coughs> so let's do another example. Suppose we want to find the integral from 0 to 2, 4e to the 2x dx, using our shorthand notation. First we need to find the antiderivative. So remember, if our original function is 4e to the 2x, then our antiderivative is 4e to the 2x over 2, which simplifies into 2e to the 2x. So now, plugging into the fundamental theorem, and using our shorthand notation, we know that our integral will equal the antiderivative from 0 to 2, since those were our bounds, we plug in the upper bound first, so we have 2e to the 2 times 2 minus 2e to the 2 times 0. Multiplying those numbers out and simplifying, we have 2e to the 4th minus 2e to the 0. Putting that in our calculator, that gives us a final answer of 107.196. You can do this with all sorts of integrals. Any type that you do, you can always incorporate the bounds. So let's look at an example where we're going to use substitution, which we learned about previously. So suppose we want to find the integral from 0 to 2 of x e to the negative x squared dx. So when we do our substitution, we want to substitute for whatever is in the power of e. That'll be our inside function. So we want to set that equal to w. So w will equal negative x squared. Remember, now we have to find our dw. So our dw 
is the derivative of w, which is negative 2x dx. And so again, we don't have a negative 2x dx, we just have an x dx. So we want to divide both sides by this negative 2 to get something we can substitute in. So dividing both sides by negative 2 leads to negative 1 half dw equals x dx. This is perfect because x dx is what we have left and what we'll need to substitute for. Okay, so negative 1 half dw equals x dx. We want to substitute, find the antiderivative, and resubstitute to complete this step of the definite integration. So again, our original function is x e to the negative x squared dx. Remember, w is negative x squared, so we plug that in as our substitution, and instead of x dx, we substitute in negative 1 half dw. The negative 1 half is a constant, so we can pull it out front. So we have negative 1 half integral of e to the w dw. Now we know that the antiderivative of e to the w is just e to the w. So our general antiderivative is negative 1 half e to the w plus c. Plugging back in for our original substitution, we get negative 1 half e to the negative x squared plus c. Well, now that we have our general antiderivative, we want to now incorporate our bounds. So using the fundamental theorem, we go back to the original equation. So the integral from 0 to 2 of x e to the negative x squared, we know equals negative 1 half e to the negative x squared. We don't need the c anymore because we're going to be plugging in bounds from 0 to 2. So again, we plug in the upper bound first. So that gives us negative 1 half e to the negative 2 squared minus and then we're going to plug in the lower bound, negative 1 half e to the negative 0 squared. Simplifying, that gives us negative 1 half e to the negative 4, plus, because again the minuses cancel up here, 1 half e to the 0. Simplifying that, plugging all those numbers into your calculator, you'll get approximately 0.491. So, now that we have a basic understanding, let's look at some infinite boundaries. Before we've had finite boundaries, which means we're looking at boundaries that go from one number to the next, such as an interval from A to B. But what if one of these boundaries goes to infinity? This is what we call an improper integral. They're similar, but we have to do a couple of extra steps to evaluate what's happening. So let's first talk about convergence. Suppose we want to take the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x squared dx. Since our graph goes to infinity to the right, we can only predict how the numerical outcome of the integration might behave. We find this by allowing the upper limit to become larger and larger. Remember, infinity is not a number, it's an idea, so you can't just plug infinity in. So instead, we'll pick a number for the top, or whichever bound has an infinity, and let it become bigger and bigger. That's the same idea as letting something go to infinity. So if we find the integral from 1 to 10 of 1 over x squared dx, if you were to put that in your calculator, you would get 0.9. If you then let the upper bound get a little bit bigger, and we did the integral from 1 to 100 of 1 over x squared dx, we get 0.99. Well, what if we then let that upper bound go to 1,000? Well, then, if we have the integral from 1 to 1,000 of 1 over x squared dx, we get 0.999. So you can see that every time we increase by a factor of 10 on our bounds, we get an extra 0.9 in our answer. So what's happening is that this answer is getting closer and closer to the number 1. So as the upper limit moves towards infinity, the area under the curve approaches 1. So this improper integral converges to 1. So let's look at another example. Let's look at the example 1 to infinity of x e to the negative x over 10 dx as its upper limit gets larger. So here, if we start with an upper limit of 10, and you integrate x e to the negative x over 10 in your calculator, you get 26.42. Well, what if we now go to 50? Well, if you take the integral to 50 of that same integral, you get 95.96. Well, that's a lot bigger. We don't see a pattern yet, but we want to try a couple more. So let's let that upper limit go to 100. So then we have x e to the negative x over 10, which gives us 99.95. Well, that's pretty close to the last one, but let's do one more. So if we do an upper limit of 200, we get that it approaches 100. 
So as the upper limit approaches infinity, the improper integral converges towards 100. You can actually try this with some larger numbers to make sure that this is true as well. Not all integrals are going to converge to a number. Some of them are going to diverge, and we call this divergence. So if we look at the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over the square root of x dx, what happens is as the upper limit moves infinitely to the right, the numerical in outcome of the integration does not seem to approach any value. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So if we integrate this function from 1 to 100, we get 18. If we then integrate the function from 1 to 1,000, we get 61.2. Okay, they don't seem to be correlated, so we want to do a couple more. So we jump to 10,000 to see if we get anything here. If you integrate to 10,000, you get 198. So it doesn't seem to be slowing down in its growth. And you can check things like 100,000 or a million, and you'll see that as the upper limit moves towards infinity, the area just keeps getting bigger and bigger. It's not approaching any one number. So we say the improper integral diverges when the outcomes just keep getting larger and don't approach any specific number.